Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to chair this session. I'm very excited to hear Dr. Pamela McKenzie speak. Um, Dr. McKenzie's been working in India, but mainly in Orissa and Andhra Pradesh for about the last 17 years. So she's got a very long, rich experience of working with dif different um, communities with linguist different ling linguistic backgrounds and a lot of um, very interesting perspectives to share with us. Thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Pamela McKenzie. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I have to say that I am quite nervous speaking in front of so many um, very uh, knowledgeable Indian high-level academics. <laughs> um, I want to actually look at some very practical situations. What we have actually tried to do, both here and in Bangladesh, of uh, helping the tribal children, um, of which there are about 8% of India's population speaks a language other than the mainstream languages, so I want to just talk about how we've actually tried to develop a multilingual education program based on local languages. So first of all, here we are. This is a picture of the tribal area in Badrachalam, which is in Andhra Pradesh, as many of you know. And we have had to walk or ride a very long road to develop the, a program that is appropriate for, for children from the tribal communities. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about the consequences of not using mother tongue. And then, have a look at why mother tongue is a key to quality and to access. Uh, then, what we need to do to develop a successful multilingual education program. And then I'll give you some examples of what we've actually done or within it, I will. Um, this picture was given to me by somebody just to say that in the tribal regions, very often, women carry the burdens of the family. I don't know if you can see, but she has a calf in her arms. On her head is a, a thing of potatoes. On top of that, I don't know what's in that basket, and on top of that, she's got her umbrella. Okay. In the world, there are, and I'm sure the linguists will correct me if I'm wrong, about 600 languages. But the education systems, it's not just in India, it is a global issue. Uh, the education systems rarely take account of the linguistic diversity in a nation, promoting only instead the dominant languages and cultures. And as I said yesterday, there are over 220 million children who have access to schooling only in a language they don't know. 67 million children are still out of school. That was 2009. 54 million of those come from what they call highly linguistically fractionalized countries. So there's a huge area that in education we are not addressing. So what happens when the curriculum, when the curriculum and the materials are inappropriate? Children face many barriers to learning because the medium of instruction is inappropriate. Education begins in a language the learner doesn't understand. In other words, the language of the home and the language of the school are different. If the teacher doesn't speak the language of the child, communication is generally non-existent and there's little or no classroom interaction. Uh, the curriculum and the textbooks for these children are totally inappropriate. In fact, the other day I was looking in an English medium school in a tribal region and the textbook they were using was the NCERT textbook. And the first sentence was, I live in a little red house. The second sentence was, I am a happy child. And I'm thinking, how is that child actually going to understand what is in the content of that? Later on in that textbook, there was a translation of something from Tagore, and even I had difficulty in understanding it. So how a tribal child will understand it, I never know. 
So the formal school environment is also very culturally distant from the tribal child. Um, and in nearly all of these cases, where the language of the home and the language of the school is different, the parents have um, nothing to do with the education of their child. They're excluded from participating. So many learners become discouraged and drop out. And of those who survive such a program, Many of them tell us that they understood nothing until either third, fourth, fifth, and some even eighth grade. There's a, a man who is now head of an NGO in the Chittagong Hill Tracks who I've been working with for quite some time. And he told me he didn't understand a thing until eighth grade. And the thing that made him connect with, the, with that second language was actually a drama that he took part in. Uh, most of his learning was only rote and memorization. When he took part in this drama, he actually connected with the language. He thought, oh, language has meaning. So now if we change our teaching methods, then maybe we'll get somewhere. But still, it's very difficult for these children. So there's an extremely high dropout rate. When I first came to Andhra Pradesh and I walked into the education secretary's office to talk about this whole issue of tribal children's learning, uh, I was sitting on the couch, and behind me, there was 75% dropout. And that was in Andhra Pradesh at that time. That was 2001. And they were really concerned about the dropout rate of the tribal children within Andhra Pradesh at that time when I walked into the office. So he was really keen to get something going. So the children struggle to understand. They often fail to learn either the school language or the language of their communities. They fail to learn basic skills and concepts. Their achievement levels are very low. Uh, Dear Jingran, who was an IAS officer and head of SSA for some time at MHRD, he did a study and looking at the achievement levels, he came out with that children at grade five were not scoring a single mark on the language test. They were reading at a grade two level, but they couldn't answer any questions. They couldn't really understand what they were reading. And the children were unable to converse in the school language. Most of that was in a Hindi situation. Uh, in these regions also, because it's so difficult, there's teacher shortage, there's high teacher absenteeism. The teacher capacity is not so strong because they really don't know how to handle such a situation. And the classroom practices are negative. Uh, this this um, uh, graph here shows, Ajit Mohanty was talking about this yesterday, uh, at the end of first grade, this was in Orissa in 2005, 27% of children were dropping out. By the end of fifth grade, another 42%. And by secondary school, there are only 20% of children actually going on through to, to grade seven. So here's... Um, this is uh, something that Dear Jingren wrote in his book, The Problem of Non-Comprehension. The children seemed totally disinterested in the teacher's monologue. They stared vacantly at the teacher and sometimes at the blackboard where some alphabets were written. Clearly aware that the children couldn't understand what he was saying, the teacher proceeded to provide an even more detailed explanation in a much louder voice, which is what we often do when people don't understand. We shout at them. Later, tired of speaking and realizing that the young children were completely lost, he asked them to start copying alphabets from the blackboard. And his comment was, my children are very good at copying from the blackboard. By the time they reach grade five, they can copy all the answers and memorize them. But only two children of the grade five students can actually speak Hindi. Now, this, this uh, quote is from um, ASER. They do a survey of primary schools in India, and this is what they came up with in 2011, and you can get this on the website. Uh, children whose home language is different from the medium of instruction at school face enormous additional problems, uh, giving the lack of bridging mechanisms to enable a smooth transition from one language to another, these children tend to uh, attend school far less regularly and the learning outcomes of the two groups of children that's the mother tongue speakers and the non the, and the mainstream speakers are unequal to begin with and these differences widen over time so the tribal child is already starting here 
and the, the mother tongue speaker is starting here, and the gap widens. So what are we going to do? This is what it's like for the children. Home language speakers, they can go into school, no problem. But where the home language and the school language is different, most of the children cannot cross that bridge, that divide. Most of them drop out. Most of them don't swim. And it's not only here. This is a, a situation that's all over the world. Um, where I've been working in the Chittagong Hill Tracks in Bangladesh also, is they state that more than half the indigenous people have no formal schooling. They face higher dropout. Only 8% there complete primary, and only 2% complete secondary. Even worse than here. And the, the people from these uh, indigenous communities are the least literate. You can find all of that on the website too. So using an inappropriate language for education has a serious negative impact on children's educational achievement. And countries cannot afford to ignore the situation if they are going to have effective learning practices. We've got to do something about it. Um, there's a recent publication, I think it's actually 2010, not 2009, as I've got on there, but they look at the, the negative effects of schooling in an unfamiliar language and what it means for the investments of governments, that the cost is actually higher if we don't do something about it. If we do do something about it, in the long run, the costs are less. So, what are we gonna do? If we're going to achieve education for all, this is what the Global Monitoring Report said in 2010, that a quality education for children from ethno-linguistic minority communities requires a culturally relevant program using an appropriate language of instruction with the production of learning materials in local languages and teachers from those communities receiving special training. So we started this before the Global Monitoring Report came out with this. Uh, we started in Andhra Pradesh back in 2001. We started talking with the government in Andhra Pradesh about what we were going to do. And this is exactly what we were trying to do. The Global Monitoring Report and EFA are now eventually catching up. So we want to bridge this gap from the mother tongue to the dominant languages and foreign languages, education, um, the languages of schooling. So how are we going to bridge this gap? So we, along with a, a, a huge number of people, we developed these ideas in multilingual education, and the purpose of it is to develop a pro program with appropriate cognitive and reasoning skills, thinking, learning, through a program of a structured language and cognitive, uh, language learning and cognitive development, enabling children to operate successfully in their mother tongue and state and national languages, or international languages. So it provides a strong foundation in the first language. It adds other languages gradually. Hopefully, by the end of a program, that the children would all be able to use all their languages for lifelong learning. So why do we use mother tongue first? Because it creates continuity and a smooth transition between home and school. This is what children need. If, you, if you're jumping from one thing to another, as we saw, most of the children drop down in between. So providing this child-friendly learning environment, the children actually stay in school a lot longer. In fact, when we started this, once this program started, there was 100% enrollment and 100% attendance. That's in Andhra Pradesh. So it puts the child at the center of the learning program because a child sees his world through his own language and through his own culture. They learn best starting from that familiar context and the learning in a classroom becomes responsive. If you look at the difference between a second language learning classroom or a child in a language they don't know and a child in their own uh, language, you will see an amazing difference. 
Um, if you were in Ajit Mohanty's uh, session yesterday, he showed some wonderful pictures of children falling asleep in the one. <laughs> and, well, I'll show you some pictures in a minute too. So, MLE, it begins with what's familiar and adds new learning. It also uses the government learning outcomes, the skills and concepts that the government requires are used, but the context that we're putting them into is different. So the children are learning everything that the government requires, but just through a different route. So the children have this strong foundation, and then they can bridge more easily to other languages and other cultures. So it has a positive impact on access. There's increased attendance by both children and staff. There's a dramatic decrease in repetition and dropout. And of course, India doesn't have repetition anymore, so the children go through it anyway. Uh, and on quality, it has a, an incredibly positive impact on children's overall language and cognitive development and their academic achievement. It leads to higher competencies in reading, maths, science, uh, where there have been tests done, the children do actually achieve a lot more, even in the second language. So children who study in their mother tongue usually learn better and faster. They perform better in tests, even in the official language. And you can find all of these things in, uh, in some of these documents. They're all on the website. Um, there was a study done in Bangladesh on the preschool children who were learning in mother tongue, and they outperformed their non-mother tongue peers in almost every competency area. So mastery of literacy and content is much easier in a language that you know and that you think in. But it extends, the benefits extend beyond just the learning. The, the whole thing of self-confidence, self-esteem is so important in children's learning. When children are emotionally stable, they can learn a lot more. So, there's another one here too, which is this generational divide, often is what they, they call it. The children actually, by using their mother tongue and their local culture, the values and the knowledge of the community um, are uh, passed on from one generation to, to another. And therefore, it doesn't create this divide between the parents and the children and the grandparents and the children. Uh, so you, using the MT, actually the mother tongue, actually develops a sense of personal worth and value, cultural identity, ensures a place in the community, encourages emotional stability, reduces alienation, social dysfunction, and political instability. How about that for mother tongue? <laughs> it's rather a lot. And I think, actually, when you actually see the children within their communities, with, with learning with the parents and with the community members, you will see such a difference and that, that this emotional stability and rooted in their community is so important for looking out into other areas. So here was in the Chittagong Hill Tracks, this lady was the, the chairperson of a women's society. She said, there is no alternative to mother tongue education. It's the only means of ensuring a good quality education. And a little boy from the same community from Tripura in the Chittagong Hill Tracks, he said, I will be regular in my class if my teacher teaches me in Tripura. This was a boy who used to run in the other direction. So it's not only teaching the mother tongue, of course. It's also providing the access to other languages and the wider world. So transitioning to other languages is an important part of the whole MLE process. Um, and this, you will know all about this because you're all second language teachers. <laughs> so additive bilingual models have been thought of as the most effective. And as we've already heard here, learning in the mother tongue for at least six years results in higher levels of achievement than those who transition too soon. Um, what Hugh, when she was studying some stuff in South Africa or in Africa, she was saying that the content of the textbooks at grade, between grade three and grade four, there's such a jump in the, the density of the content that if you don't maintain mother tongue, this is where the children actually tend to drop out and to, to lose out in the academics. So having mother tongue supporting second language learning and learning content material for as long as possible is best. Uh, gradually adding second and third languages, not abruptly moving from one to the other, is 
I mean, to us it might be obvious, but very often the children will learn in mother tongue till grade three and then suddenly in grade four everything's in English or in another language. Well, that's not going to work either because that's where the children will drop out. So gradual transition. And only those who keep their mother tongue throughout their school career are likely to become bi or fully multilingual. So this is just a chart to show the stages of learning both language and concepts. Um, you will have access to this, I think, on the website, so <laughs> um, I'm not going to go through it all now, but we, we look at seven stages. Mother tongue, everything in mother tongue first, uh, oral first, then reading and writing. And that's oral first in mother tongue, reading and writing in mother tongue, oral first in second language, reading and writing in second language, and so on. Children need to hear before they can produce, and they need to hear also before they can read. They need to understand what they, the language is all about. Just another way of putting it. So the, the way of ensuring this bridging process, uh, the pace and effectiveness of it will depend very much on where the children live, how much exposure they've had to the second language. When we're talking about tribal children, most of them have no exposure whatsoever to the second language. They are monolingual when they come into the classroom. If they live close to a village or a market or something like that, they may have some exposure. If they have TVs in the community, they may also have some exposure. But actually, what we found is that they have very little. So in the early years, uh, you need an in much more informal, playful approach to learning the language, putting things in their daily routine. Um, some listening. So if you are going to introduce a second language early, make sure that the children are sort of actively learning it. There's n you know, no good children sitting and passively trying to, to bring it in. But use active um, learning methods for helping the children. Uh, learn the second language. Uh, a lot of people use this thing they call TPR, Total Physical Response, which is actually quite a good idea, but just uses good teaching methods. Uh, for older children, there's a more systematic learning of the second language. Again, oral first, then written. And a gradual uh, increase in the use of the second language in academic subjects. But as we saw yesterday, or the other day, with the Cummins Quadrant, we have to be very careful that we're going through the right route to get to that second language with the academic concepts really learnt. Uh, yeah, then the introduction of L3. So this is a possible progression plan. And of course, depending on where the children are, this, we need to be flexible. So how can we do it? This is something that has helped me a lot in looking at all the different areas that are required for developing a multilingual education program. And again, you can look at this on the website. And I'm going to go through some of these, like a policy. It's really, Ajit Mahanti was talking yesterday about ERISA having a policy. Well, Andhra Pradesh needs it as well. So if there's anybody here who can write a policy for Andhra, Andhra Pradesh and get it accepted by the politicians, then please go ahead and do it. Um, the Right to Education Act is also now something that can be used uh, to ensure mother tongue. But the problem with the RTE is that it says mother tongue instruction to the extent possible. So many governments will say it's impossible and do nothing. But you can actually now go to a commission. I think there's a complaints commission that can actually be used. And dear Jingran, who was our fantastic ally in all of this from uh, SSA in Delhi for many years. He is now on the Complaints Commission of the RTE and he's very willing for you to actually go through him to get something done on this issue. I'll give you his email if you would like it. <laughs> so, um, when we started this, we did a huge amount of advocacy. I cannot tell you how many hours I sat in government offices uh, the current system at the time was not working, and so actually they were quite pleased in some cases that we had gone in. But we used a lot of the research and the theory and international agency statements that the government had already signed up to, to actually try and push them in this direction. And we needed to also understand what was legally binding on the government. Um, 
and then we provided a feasible plan. What, what I did in Andhra Pradesh was to get all the linguists from the universities together, who, anybody who had worked on the local languages. There were a lot of PhD students who had worked on languages in Andhra Pradesh. And we got them all together and, um, and we actually worked out a program that we could take to the government and say, this is how you can do it. This is how much it will cost. This is <laughs> and uh, so we went into the education secretary and in 2003 he said, we'll do it. So there you are. I just thought I'll put a picture up there. This was one of the times that we were sitting discussing the whole thing of multilingual education with government officers. And you'll notice the gender imbalance. I'm sure it's not quite like that now. I think that was in Madhya Pradesh, actually. <laughs> um, so, the program in AP and Arissa, we started in Andhra Pradesh with eight languages. We suggested three languages, but the government said, no, we're doing eight languages. Um, we, we went to Arissa in 2005 to talk, and um, various people were there, like a, a very famous linguist in uh, Arissa, whose name escapes me just now. D.P. Patanayak. Yeah, he came with us into the government and we discussed with the education secretary there at the time and he was really interested. So we needed allies all the way to get something going. Uh, and they were very open at the time. So to get this thing started, all the government structures were used. So tribal development, SSA, they used the funding from SSA and various places, all for achieving EFA, Education for All. So, it took a whole year to develop the orthography and the curriculum and materials for language, maths, and EVS uh, for grade one. At, at the time, when we started in Andhra Pradesh, the national curriculum framework hadn't actually been um, established, but they were discussing it at the time. So we used the discussion papers to actually develop a program based on what would be the national curriculum framework. Luckily, we were quite close. <laughs> uh, we worked with local teachers, local communities, and in each place it was piloted first in, um, I can't remember, was it 10 schools in Andhra and 20 in Orissa? I think so. But then there was rather quick expansion, which wasn't really a good idea, but anyway. There was a lot of mobilization. The linguists helped enormously in mobilization because when they were going around collecting the data, this actually helped encourage the communities to, to become part of this whole process. Um, and when the teachers came in to help develop materials, they also got infused about their own languages. Um, teachers visited every village where the Emily program was going to start and discussed it with the parents as well. We worked with the communities all the way through. Without community participation, multilingual education is impossible. It's got to be with the communities. So there were respected members, the elders, the parents, there were teachers, graduates help, artists, storytellers, musicians, um, even in, in um, Arissa especially, a lot of theater groups were involved. So here's one. We were gathering data here. This is the community uh, checking some of the materials. And even if they couldn't read, somebody would read it to them. There was an awful lot of collaboration going on. Um, the multilingual dictionaries, which sadly are still not done, which should be done. Uh, Andhra Pradesh has, or in the process of developing a dictionary, a multilingual dictionary in each of those eight languages. So it's a nice big thick dictionary with about 15 to 20,000 words in each dictionary in four languages. So they've got it in mother tongue, Telugu, Hindi, and English. Absolutely amazing work, but it really needs to be finished so that the people can use it. Uh, these are phrase books that were developed. This, is, this one is in from Adilabad, Gondi, Kalami, English, Telugu, and Hindi, and in three scripts. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, when we did the curriculum development, we looked at all the, the local cultural and daily activities that the communities were involved in. So the knowledge, skills, customs, the environment of the local community were used to develop uh, and achieve the government's competencies. We used this integrated theme-based approach for the early years uh, to help link with the community and the schooling experience. Here's what we use to actually plan, develop the teacher's thinking. 
Uh, resources. You know, with this program, we were starting from scratch. There was nothing. There were no alphabets, nothing. So the linguists developed the alphabets. They developed a writing system for all these. Telugu script was used uh, in, in Orissa, Oriya script. So in some cases, we used uh, theme pictures for early grades language development. There were textbooks, which I didn't quite like because I think we go back to rote learning if we use textbooks. We used a lot of theme-based activities uh, using the skills and concepts in meaningful contexts. Big book stories. Um, this one's in English. This one's in English, but we used a lot of uh, classroom reading materials. Um, listening stories. These were stories from the community that we wrote down. The teacher either told them or read them. Uh, children's library books. They, they, they even made their own materials in the classrooms. We used fact sheets and books and, as I said, classroom-made materials. So, preparing materials. This was in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. This was developing a theme picture. We used the local artists. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, look at that. That's just a wonderful picture of a local village with all the activities going on in the village. What a wonderful picture for children to actually discuss developing their oral language. This one was from Koya, I think. The rainy season. It's developing alphabet charts. And these are, this is Chittagong Hill Tracks. These are just using the local, uh, local artifacts, local things to develop a, um, sorry, my brain's just gone, <laughs> gone dead, uh, to develop the alphabet chart. <laughs> alphabet books, this was the first draft of one for Chittagong Hill. This is Andhra Pradesh. This is a Koya alphabet chart. I think this one's a Gandhi uh, alphabet book. Am I right? All in Telugu script. So you'll be able to read it if you know Telugu. How much? <laughs> yeah? This, this was a fantastic story. This is again from the Chittagong Hill Tracks. Uh, this is a bear and a squirrel going out to collect mangoes. Uh, the bear obviously could reach all the mangoes, so he's got the basket on, and you can see the little squirrel with his little basket. Uh, they were going along, and the bear was carrying them all and put them all in his basket like this. But the squirrel had cut the bottom of the basket off, and he was taking all the mangoes out. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, what a fantastic story, local story. I, I mean, have we got any of those in our Telugu or Hindi books? This is another one. I'm not going to tell you this story because it's a bit rude, but <laughs> that is about a, a mother chicken and little chicks. And actually, in the end, this story, the fox got them all. But that's a true, a true thing in those communities. You know, they've got chickens and the foxes come in. This was another a big book story about a child that got lost at a wedding party. The whole family had gone. This one was actually learning to uh, something to do with um, uh, kinship terms, of which they have very many. So the mother was going around asking everybody, "Have you seen so and so? Have you seen so and so?" And you know, all the time she was asking uh, my father's uncle, my mother's uncle, my <laughs> maternal grandmother, <laughs> you know, all kinds of different things. And you'll see here that, you know, they've got the local dress, which is very important to the communities in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. They all have different style um, um, patterns. There you are, another cute materials. And this again is from uh, Koya, I think. Um, this was all to do with drums, local, local drums. The whole book was uh, facts and information about what they used the drums for, when they used them. Another little story about a big wind. And this, this is from Arissa, a Saura story, uh, using the local, the traditional art. Uh, absolutely amazing. It's absolutely beautiful. E each one of these pictures was a different page on the book, and, and they told a story. It was about a little girl who got lost in the forest because she was chasing a butterfly. Again, this is a marma child in the Chittagong Hill Tracks reading a marma story. 
Just look at his concentration. <laughs> this again in Sarah and Arissa. The, the women of the village actually painted this story on the classroom wall. There they're developing listening stories. They're writing, you know, local stories for listening. This is a grade two storybook. I think, is this in Koya? Yeah? So Ramesh over here is a, um, a linguist who's been working on the program for 10 years. So if you have any questions about the Andhra Pradesh story, Ramesh is here. There he is. <laughs> Brilliant help. This was one of the uh, workshops that we did to develop stories. This was in Utno in Adilabad. Um, the man in the middle there was the IAS officer who was an absolute fantastic support. Sorry? What was his name? Yeah, see how yeah, you know him. <laughs> IAS officer, yeah. I mean, yeah, he was such a great support, really fantastic. Okay, then when we're talking about maths, we actually used local, um, uh, what they did in the local community to do with maths. So incorporating some of the ideas from the community uh, actually to learn maths and to bridge from what they did in the local communities to sort of mainstream maths. I haven't got time to go through all this. Teacher training is obviously an incredibly big issue. In, in the early years, all the teachers need to be mother tongue teachers. They need to be bilingual. Uh, training programs need to incorporate best practices. And we've been talking about this among a number of people here that best practices for first language teaching as well as second language teaching we do, and third language teaching. Uh, you know, we need to incorporate best practices for learning to read and write or any, you know, have an effective classroom pedagogy, which is creative and responsive, focusing on meaning and comprehension, not rote learning. In fact, if you've got all these books in mother tongue, it's actually easier to memorize it. So what are we going to do? The teachers, when they're actually changing from one way of teaching to another, need an incredible lot of support too. So new teaching practices don't come easily. So, you know, you need a whole group of people to give support to the teachers. It's not just don't teach, you know, train the teacher for a week and then send them out. Continually give support. Uh, we did provide teachers guides in a number of places, giving the daily activities because that is a help to uh, teachers when they're um, using new practices, lots of ideas. Yeah, this is te teacher training up in the Chittagong Hills. Look, they're even enjoying it. <laughs> Actually, what we, we made them do, practice every single piece of material. They, we made, you know, they practiced among themselves before they went out to the classroom. And here's a preschool classroom. Oh, another one. These are Chittagong Hills. And this is in the Koya area. Look at their faces. How they love singing in their mother tongue. Okay, now here's just, if I can get this going right. This is just um, a little video. I've got a few little videos of um, some children. This is an NGO work in, in Orissa. Uh, here they're learning Desia letters. Is there sound? Um, where am I going? Uh, this is um, doing some number. Can't find it. Help. Nope. The thing's gone. Oh, there it is. Intense concentration. So instead of just copying from the blackboard, using some other activity ideas. This is reading in mother tongue. Similar. 
Okay. Creative writing is a thing that we never do, I don't think, in our classrooms. But the children in, this, in these schools, they are writing in their mother tongue. They're drawing pictures. And, I mean, it's just lovely to see how much they're doing and how involved they are in it. And this is uh, the result of one of the stories. I, look how much that child has written. That's in mother tongue using audio script, Desia. Yeah? Okay, this is just a pattern that we tried to develop for using second language learning, all the kinds of activities that young leaders, you know, maybe second grade, I think, at this stage. This is a story in two languages, mother tongue and aria. Um, this was developed with the um, uh, SSA OPIPA program in Orissa. Now, this, if I can get it, this child is reading in aria. Was that our Aria? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> I did get it right then. <laughs> but that's the child's second language. And I, personally, I think that's not too bad for a second language. Okay, this, this little video is about a role play. They're role playing, um, you know, a shop um, in second language. <laughs> Cute, eh? Okay, now this, I don't know what you'll think about this, but this is attempting to learn English, and they're not doing badly when you think that these children never hear English. Sumoni standing. Sumoni standing in the middle. Where is she standing? She is standing in the middle. Very good. <laughs> Where is Komu standing? Komu is standing left the left side. Right side. Right side. Where is Komu standing? Komu is standing on the very good. Where is he standing? He is standing on the right side. Where is BJ standing? BJ is standing on the left side. Where is he standing? He is standing on the left side. Where is <laughs> when you think actually they're they're practicing he and she in this as well as left and right. Because I think in Aria, you don't have these he and she. So you have to use so-and-so is standing. So in English, uh, who, some, somebody who was talking earlier this morning, that some of the things are not in the mother tongue and not in the second language. And in the third language, you've got different things to do. So Now, this, this little video is a, an English book that has been developed in the local community using the local ideas for reading English. It is Sumi, Sumi, oh, it is Auntie, Auntie Padma. She, she is pounding, padding. She gets stuck on this word. What? Wait. Wait. Oh, ma, ma, 
I, um, well, I don't know what you think about that. Maybe you can say something afterwards. But I actually think that's pretty good for probably a grade four child in a tribal village in Lamptaput in Orissa. That's um, pretty good reading. Um, I have, oh, dear. Um, we haven't got all that much time, and I wanted to get on to some of the other things. So implementation, obviously, is very important. Um, I've gone through some of these things already. You can have a look at this on the website, I think. But there were, there's quite a lot of obstacles to the program, and there still are a number of obstacles to getting it institu institutionalized. Um, so here are some of the obstacles. Ajit Mahanti also spoke about some of those yesterday. Uh, lack of clear policy is one. Officials changing and new ideas coming in, or they're not interested in the mother tongue program. It needs something established within the system to actually, you know, so that a new official can't just say, no, we're not going to do it. Uh, teacher training is a big one. So MLE in India is still very fragile. There's a lot of good uh, programs going on. There's a lot of good stuff going on, but it isn't, uh, it isn't incorporated into the psyche yet. Uh, change of government, continual advocacy is needed. Central government is only giving tacit support, although NCERT is now playing a much more active role, still often seen as a pilot program. So strong policy and financial commitment is important. Training at every level. Community involvement is important. Um, educational program planning at a mainstream level, not just pilot. Uh, we also need a lot of competent language teachers who are trained in good methodologies, both for L1 and L2, etc. Uh, integrating it, uh, strengthen, oh yeah, strengthening uh, something at the center and embedding it in the, in the structures, having a team of dedicated people uh, to, to actually support this program at all levels. Uh, yeah, you've got multi-grade, multi-level, multiple languages, cultural adaptations of materials, not just translations. Gaining local support, very important. Using all the networks that we can to give support to the program. Strengthening the voice of the communities. Do we need to change the way language is taught? Uh, need a clear framework for, for training and classroom practice. All, the, all of these things, we know what we need to do. It's a question of actually getting it done. Research, really important. Longitudinal research to show that these things, you know, what is, what is working, what is not. How do we need to strengthen the programs? Documentation of all the programs. Building that body of evidence. So, what have we learned and what next? This is what I think we need to do next. Target teacher training. Teacher deployment is a real issue. Make sure that you get your mother tongue teachers in those schools. Um, last year, Ramesh and I visited some MLE schools in the uh, Badrachalam district, and out of six schools, only three were probably working properly in MLE. One school had been working properly. The teacher had gone, and a Telugu teacher had come in, and there was not an MLE book in sight. And so it had changed from a really positive MLE uh, uh, school to something which wasn't working. Dedicated full teams, building capacity, comprehensive planning with a good roadmap, quality improvement in classrooms. That's changing everything. Curriculum, syllabus, textbooks, uh, including assessment procedures. So while technically it's not a problem, it does take a huge effort on the part of everybody. And there's a lot of hazards and obstacles to overcome. Implementation is not always easy. Teacher training is essential. It's been tried and tested in many locations and proved to be successful. It can be done. So are we going to do it? 
and are we gonna have children in our classrooms like this? This is the first time some Koya children were listening to a story in their own mother tongue. Every eye is on that teacher. And look at that, that's a, a, a big book that the children are just engrossed in. This was a story in the mother tongue out under a tamarind tree, and the story actually happened to be about a tamarind tree. Oh, visitors. Oh, this is in Bangladesh. These are the children, what the children like to do. All girls up the tree. All the boys were down the bottom, and all the girls were at the top. It was quite a big tree, too. There you are, here's the boys. <laughs> And I think that's probably where I can finish. Is that all right? Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, really interesting, uh, informative presentation. I think it's really interesting to see, uh, too often as English teachers, we're, we're stuck in our own world, and it's really nice to be introduced to a wider world of language teaching. So thank you very much, Pamela, for that presentation. We've got around 10 minutes for questions, so could you please put your hand up, keep your questions brief as... Ma'am, you said in your presentation, when children are emotionally stable, they learn a lot. And in presentation, we have seen that mama story, you said that look at his uh, concentration. So especially with uh, small children, or especially the children of primary school. What I think that, uh, I think that we are committing a big crime by providing them second language in their primary classes. And I found it, it at my home when I took uh, homework or exercise of my niece. That time I came to uh, know that she is struggling with other language. Okay, so uh, what is your views in this regard? Thank you, ma'am. You, you, I think you said it's a crime, yeah? To teach children in a language they don't know. Uh, I think if Tove Skutnab Kangas was here, she would totally agree with you. Nobody has the right to play with somebody's emotions. And I think, yeah, when we've got young children in a classroom struggling to learn, I, so many of these children run in the opposite direction rather than coming to school when it, when the teacher doesn't speak their language, or when the curriculum is not in their language. And yeah, well, maybe you should take it to the RTE uh, Crimes Commission. <laughs> okay, thank you. So there's a question at the back. Uh, Ma'am, uh, the conclusions and all, you know, were quite uh, uh, interesting and, uh, and appreciable, you know, the suggestions you made. But uh, in, the, in the meanwhile, you know, you have commented uh, something about uh, the NCERT text uh, and, uh, and you found it inappropriate. I live in a red house, I'm happy. So these concepts, you know, so that's my apprehension, you know, like uh, house uh, can be a hamlet, you know, for him, you know. And the color and the house, you know, it is not a thing which is something quite difficult for the child to comprehend. Is it that much difficult, you know, to comprehend uh, the color and the concept of house? and the emotional feeling of uh, hap happiness and all. So that is one question. And then regarding the other dropouts, you know, maybe uh, it's but something particular with my state. Uh, the dropouts rate is not at all to deal with the children, you know, or their interest in the language or the comprehensibility. It generally relates with the parental, socio-economic background and such things, you know, even if there is a, uh, is a dropout. So, uh, like these two things you have been highlighting, so there was a slight apprehension in that. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yeah, the, the textbook, well, I think, you know, having seen it, the children and the teacher were both struggling with the textbook. I think it is much better to use something that is within the child's uh, known environment to start. Yeah, Little Red House, it was a, like a little brick house with a, white child, I think. Uh, the mother was standing in a, you know, a nice big kitchen with a big stirring pot. Most of these children, their mothers cook on uh, fire, either in or out of the house. Um, yeah, I mean, it's up to you what you use and what you think is appropriate. <laughs> but I would say that it's not appropriate. 
Very difficult. Um, the dropout rate, yeah, I know there's an awful lot of other things that are contributing to a dropout rate, but we have seen in many areas where the parents and the school, are, or the home and the school is much cl more closely linked, that the children are much happier going to school and they don't run away. The parents are much more supportive too. Um, yeah, different places have different, different ideas. I don't know. You'd have to look much, very closely at the local conditions, see what's Thank best you. to do. Uh, okay, there's a lady in the front in a green sari, and then at the back, uh, there was somebody with their hand up at the back? Oh, that's gone down. Okay, so then the gentleman behind her with the pink shirt after that. Thank you, ma'am, for your nice presentation. Uh, in uh, one of these slides, you mentioned that uh, priority should be given to reading, sorry, listening and speaking first. Uh, but on the contrary, in Indian context, uh, priority is being given to uh, writing and uh, reading, ma'am. So much loads of homework is being given to the students, uh, particularly writing. But uh, strangely, one of my friends who lives in um, America, she says that uh, her child developed bad handwriting uh, simply because they have neglected that area at a later date. She began to practice uh, handwriting at a later date. Because here children are being given so much writing exercise, most of the Indian children, they are developing good handwriting. That is her intention. What do you say about this? Okay, thank you. I actually think you have to be an artist to write Indian languages. So, yeah, you need a lot of practice. Uh, when you look at the Telugu script, the Uriya script, the Hindi script, they're all very elaborate, aren't they? <laughs> so they need a lot of practice. But um, I think when, you, when it comes to learning the alphabet, the letters, there are ways of doing it to help a child uh, remember the sound and, re you know, the sound-symbol relationship is important for a child to learn. Handwriting, of course, is important, although I would say it's not as important now. I think nobody can read my handwriting anymore because I use computers all the time. But, yeah, we do have to develop that skill of writing. Um, but to develop a comprehension of the reading, we have to have... Uh, we have to know the sounds of the language and the structure of the language, which comes through a lot of oral practice. If we're going to use the language, we need to be able to produce it. So we need a lot of activities for the children in all four areas, um, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. I don't think we, need, we should be leaving any of those areas out. We need to develop all of it. And some of it, of course, um, supports the other. So writing supports reading, Listening also supports reading and writing, so on. So they're all kind of interrelated. But the skill of actually writing, handwriting, that takes a lot of practice. Okay, gentleman there in the pink shirt. From my own experience in uh, supervising is, uh, teacher students, I noticed that the reason is not using the mother tongue or so and so and so. If the teacher has good strategies, good techniques, he can't. Uh, teach students well and better than the, those who use mother tongue and they have, don't have good uh, techniques and uh, strategies. So you put just emphasis on using mother tongue rather than you put emphasis on the teacher training and the strategies and uh, techniques he uses. The, re the teacher himself may be the reason for this dropping and falling. This is what I say. Te uh, teaching techniques are incredibly important, whichever language you're using. And if you are having to teach in a, a second language, if those children are in a second language classroom, those techniques become even more important. Yeah. But techniques for teaching mother tongue, for teaching second language, teacher training is an absolute essential. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Here my question is, do you believe that Children should be given education in English medium right from class one. Or do you believe that children should be given education in their, with the help of their mother tongue in order to make them effective speakers in English? Okay, thank you very much. Let's have another question. We'll have two or three questions and then Dr. McKenzie will ask them together, answer them together. 
Good afternoon, all of you. Uh, Could you put the mic a little closer to your mouth? Thank you. Okay. Yesterday, when I was attending a presentation at the other classroom, I came across a valuable quotation, probably by George Bernard Shaw. No man fully capable of his own language ever master another. Standing in front of you, and whatever the English I learned and speak, it all because of my mother tongue, I can say proudly. Every year after uh, schools reopen, we go, uh, we go and meet parents, requesting them to join their children in our government schools. The majority of the parents not willing to join their children in our schools. Uh, in our government schools, we are not, not directly providing English medium. So the majority of the parents requesting us to teach in English medium. So they are getting their children uh, joined in uh, nearby government private schools, or you say English medium schools. So after some uh, considerable, uh, some, a couple of months, or one, say one or two years, they get their children back in our schools again. Since the child is not capable of learning either Telugu or uh, English, and the, the boy is okay. uh, unable Th to... Thank you very much. So, so you're saying that the children leave because uh, they want English, but then they come back. Come okay. back Perhaps Dr. Dr. McKenzie can comment on that in a moment. Um, there's a gentleman at the back there waiting for a question, and then there are two questions here at the front. So we'll take this one, and then Dr. McKenzie will answer, and then we'll take these two, and then I think we'll have to finish. Thanks. My question is related to actually Chitang Hill Tracks. As you study covers Chitang Hill Tracks, which doesn't even make up the, you know, the whole geographic area of Bangladesh. In terms of that, it doesn't even make up the two, three percent of it. And it is the least populated area due to its poor route networks and communication networks. Uh, so are you trying to say that this study generalized the whole picture of Bangladesh? Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question here from the front, I think. Can we write uh, that is the state languages, uh, that is suppose Telugu, in English textbooks to understand the students, bilingual texts? Okay, thank you. So we've got uh, three questions. So the first two comments were around um, English medium versus mother tongue medium. How do you convince parents that one is better than the other? Um, then there was a question around um, using local languages in English textbooks and a question around whether your work in Bangladesh in one local area, whether you're generalizing about the whole country or just, or, or not. Okay. Um, English medium from class one. Um, I think from what I've been saying, it's quite clear that I don't think there's a good idea. Um, certainly you can teach English as a subject if you are teaching it in the right way to very young children. It's okay to do it, but it has to be done in the right way, which is why we need a lot of training and, and good teaching methods. Um, English, mother tongue to English. I have seen some schools lately doing um, what they're calling like heritage language English medium schools. So they're going from mother tongue to English and the third language would be the state language. So I've seen some of those. Um, some of them are working reasonably well, but again, the materials really need to be adapted to the local, the, the, uh, local environment. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's interesting to hear that parents were putting children in an English medium school, the children were not doing well, and they're sending them back to the, uh, the, the, the mother tongue schools. I think that's really interesting um, s situation. You don't hear that very often. So maybe that's a positive move. Um, bilingual texts, that is one strategy that you can use for teaching a second language. Um, sometimes if a child knows the one language better than the other, they'll just go to the language they know and they won't learn the second language. So you have to actually work with the children to learn the second language on bilingual texts. They will uh, you know, look at both but they'll tend to go to the one that they can read more easily if they're left on their own. So I think you need to have some teaching strategies for using bilingual texts. Um, but it is one way of 
developing a second language with meaning. Yeah. Was there another question? Oh, generalizing from this. Um, I have used these examples because this is where we have worked. Uh, I mean, these, these are contexts that are also familiar to you. But this is happening all over the world. And the same situations, if you were in the South African uh, program yesterday, uh, you could see exactly the same issues going on. Uh, you go to the Philippines, you will see exactly the same issues going on. If you go to Indonesia, you'll see exactly the same things going on. All over the world where you get a multilingual context where children come from minority language communities where their languages are not used in any other domain than the home, you will get the same uh, educational problems going on. This, you, what you have to do is to uh, look at the local issue, the, 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 the local context for developing a program that is appropriate to that situation. But the situations are so similar across the world, almost everywhere that you go with highly uh, multilingual contexts, you will find the same issues. So yeah, we are looking at local issues and we're looking at global issues. Does that answer the question? I hope so. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so please do stay and ask her any questions. Her PowerPoint will be available on the British Council's Facebook site, Teach English in India hyphen British Council. They'll be available probably from slightly later this week, maybe tomorrow. So you can go in and have a look at her presentation. Um, so there are lots of references there that you can look at as well. So it just uh, leaves me to say thank you very much, Dr. McKenzie. Please put your hands together to say thank you.